All right. Um, it's been about five minutes. I think we can start. We'll wait. Uh, we'll see as people join. Um, I feel like a lot of people will end up watching the recorded version of this. So, cool. Let's go. Hey, everyone. I'm Hardik. You've all seen me here. Um, I'm a protocol engineer at Ceramic Network, and here... Well, we've been building Learn Web 3 DAO over the last month or so with everyone else from the team. And we're going to, today is the first live session. And I'm very inexperienced right now. This will get better over time. But today we're going to be covering the freshman track cryptocurrency tutorial. So, like, we had a vote on Discord. Um, if you saw, we asked all of you which level do you want to see. And we had the most votes for the freshman track uh, cryptocurrency tutorial. So here we are. Um, if you have any questions, um, post it in the chat. I will periodically be checking the chat every now and then. And there will also be time for questions like after we've gone through this. So cool. Um, cool. So let's start. Okay. So what, what, what is a cryptocurrency? right? Um, some of you may have gone through the tracks already. Some of you may have not. So we're going to start from the beginning. So essentially, when you want to deploy, a, so cryptocurrencies are like, like Bitcoin, right? Like Bitcoin, Ethereum, all these other like hundreds of tokens, thousands of tokens you can find on like CoinGecko, right? Like these are all examples of like cryptocurrencies, right? So if you wanted to make your own also, nobody look at the crypto price charts today. They're so bad. But <laughs> so if you wanted to make your own, thankfully, Ethereum can let you do that because Ethereum allows you to program your own smart contracts, right? And we can very easily make our own cryptocurrency in less than 10 lines of code um, on Ethereum. So what we're going to be learning about today is we're going to be following a token standard called ERC-20. So what is ERC-20, right? Well, what is ERC in the first place? So ERC is, ERC stands for Ethereum Request for a Comment. It's essentially a way for people to like put up standards, like write specifications of a standard code and code. And then they're requesting for comments from the like broader community on it. And after a few iterations, usually like things sort of get accepted as a standard and they move into like the final stage here, at which point they're locked. They're like no more changes are happening to that standard anymore. Um, and like people use it, right? Like it's standardized. So like um, everybody can use it. So like, let's take a look at number 20 here, ERC20. This was actually written, co-authored by Vitalik himself. Um, so if we go to number 20 here, it's um, it's basically a document that says, okay, like this standard allows for the implementation for tokens within smart contracts, right? And then it tells you everything you need to comply with the standard. So, okay, you need like optionally, you need this function, optionally, you need this function, yada, 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 and all of these functions. So ERC-20, we will use the standard to create our token. Um, now the question is like, why do we want to use ERC-20? Like, why can't I just write my own code, right? So if you've seen on like MetaMask, okay? So let me go to MetaMask. Let me switch to like Rinkeby. So on Rinkeby, you may have seen like, okay, like I have some ETH here but I also have some LW3 token that I like deployed earlier, right? How does MetaMask know this? How does MetaMask know the name? How does MetaMask allow me to send this token to someone else? Like if I just click send here, choose an address and like say like I wanna send like one token, um, I can send it straight from MetaMask. MetaMask doesn't have my source code. It doesn't know, uh, what code is in the smart contract. So how can it let me send the token? How does it know which function to call, right? 
Um, this is why, like, this is where standardization is important. This is where ERC-20 comes in. Uh, since we are following the standard, we must have a function called transfer. I don't know if you can read this. Let me try to zoom in. Um, yeah. So we must have a function called transfer, and we must have a function called transfer from. The difference between them is subtle. We won't get into that right now. But since we are following the standard, MetaMask knows I don't care what custom code you have in your contract because as long as it's an ERC-20, it's going to have these two functions. And I can call those functions. And your rest of the code, like MetaMask doesn't know it. MetaMask doesn't care about it. Um, but when you hit send, all it's doing is it's calling the transfer function for you. Um, so that's kind of cool. That's why you want to use standards. Um, and then, yeah. Okay, so, so let's get to coding, right? So make sure, I guess like if you're following along with this, make sure you have downloaded and installed MetaMask. Um, um, you can get it from like, just like if you search for like MetaMask download, um, you'll find the Chrome extension for it. Um, so just add the Chrome extension in your browser, set up your wallet, and then let's switch over here, click here, and switch to the Rinkeby test network. You probably don't have as many options here as I do, but don't worry about that. But just switch to the Rinkeby test network. Um, oh, actually, if you're just setting up your wallet, you actually may not see the Rinkeby test network here. So the way to fix that is go to your MetaMask settings, go to advanced, and then turn on show test networks, okay? So once you turn on show test networks, um, all of these like these four or five different test nets will become available to you. So yeah, so let's switch to the Rinkeby test network and let's get some ETH here. So there's a few different uh, Rinkeby faucets that we can use. I'm gonna post a link in chat in case you're following along. Um, let me see, how do I actually do that? Do I have to go on my own stream and type a message? Hmm, it's kind of a thing. Oh God. Come on. <laughs> All right. Oh, Rinkby. What do you mean Rinkby is locked? How can Rinkby cannot be locked? Um, okay. Well, recently, actually, the Ether scan for Rinkby has been going down. Okay, wait. Seems to be working fine 13 seconds ago. Cool. So go to a faucet, kind of like this, um, and let's see, guys, okay, so I'll sign in with Twitter, sure, let's do that, and then I will copy your address from MetaMask, so you can copy it just by like clip, clicking over here, copy your address, um, enter your address here, hit claim, it may take like 10-15 seconds. Um, but my balance should update. I think this, this will give me, how much does it give me? 0 0.1 ETH on Rinkaby. Okay. Let's just wait. All right, I'm, I'm also going to check chat real quick if there's any questions. Um, oh, Almas, that's a nice question actually. So why you... Why people on Twitter say you shouldn't use MetaMask. So MetaMask is a self-custodial wallet, okay? What that means is you are in control of your private keys. If you uninstall MetaMask, if you reformat your computer, if your computer like dies um, and you don't have your private keys backed up, you're shit out of luck. Like there's, there's no way you can get your money back. Um, so for that reason, that's, that's one reason that sometimes people say that beginners, maybe like beginners who are just like trading, uh, maybe shouldn't keep money in MetaMask because if they lose their private key, um, you lose all your money. So that's one reason. 
The other reason is there's a lot of scammers out there. Um, as cryptocurrency is becoming more and more famous and like more and more new people are joining who don't understand like all these nuances and all these like possible issues that can happen. Um, there's a lot of scammers trying to take advantage of this. And what they will do, um, let me see if I can actually find a scammer link. I probably have like hundreds of them in my DMs somewhere, but I usually delete my DMs, so I don't know if I'm gonna find it. Um, okay, never mind. But basically, a scammer will send you a link that will pop up something that looks like MetaMask, and it might say, oh, because of a security reason, we need you to re-enter your private key to access your wallet. But it's not actually MetaMask. They're popping up. They're just popping up a browser window. And the way you can distinguish this is like, if you click on the MetaMask extension, it shows up like this, right? Like there's no border to it. Um, it's like tied to like your browser window, right? A pop-up will look slightly different because it will look like, it will, it will kind of look like this, right? Like it will look like a small uh, browser window. But they clone the exact UI of MetaMask and they're like, oh, please enter your private key to get access to your wallet. And people do that, right? People people don't understand, they're beginners, and they lose their money. So, okay. Maybe I said more than I should there, but um, the idea is just be just be careful. Cool. So, okay, I, ha I have my ETH now. Um, so once you have the ETH, let's, we can actually get started with writing code. So we wanna go to Remix. Um, I'll drop the link for this in chat. Oh God, I hate that I have to go to my own live stream to send messages. Hmm. Open up Remix. Um, so Remix, for those of you who don't know, if you're just starting up the freshman track, it's a Ethereum IDE. So it lets you write smart contracts, debug smart contracts, compile them, deploy them to a network, and so on and so on. So go to Remix, and what you wanna do is you wanna, actually, let me zoom, let me zoom in. Okay, so yeah, go to Remix. There's this like tiny icon here, click that, and let's say you name it lw3token.sol. So .sol is the extension for like Solidity files, right? Like Solidity smart contracts. Um, so the first line in every Solidity smart contract is this special line called pragma. This essentially tells you, this essentially tells the network, okay, like what version of Solidity do I want to use? And the syntax up 0 0.8.0 .0 means any version from 0 0.8.0 .0 to like any version which is like 0.8.x, like the small version differences don't matter. And we do this and Remember we mentioned like we want to use ERC20. ERC20 has a lot of functions and it's kind of tricky to implement in certain parts. So maybe we don't want to implement it ourselves, right? Um, even in like this uh, EIP right here, like the ERC spec right here, there's a link to an example implementation from Open Zeppelin. Open Zeppelin is a security company that builds secure Ethereum smart contracts, among other things. And we can actually use, so Open Zeppelin has like base contracts for things like ERC-20 and other common Ethereum standards. And we're just gonna be piggybacking off of them. So we're gonna take their secure implementation, we're gonna like change like a couple of tiny things here and there. And uh, that's, that's really all you need to do to have your own cryptocurrency. So, 
So you can f find their implementation of ERC-20 by going to their GitHub and following like contracts, token, ERC-20, ERC-20.sol. Um, and yeah, so find this, like take this link, open this on GitHub, take this link, copy this link, and then you can actually import it directly in Remix just from the link. So you want to import ERC-20 contract from Open Zeppelin, And to do this, you just do import and in double quotes in a string, you paste that link you just copied and end it with a semicolon, right? And Remix is smart. Remix will figure out um, what contract you are trying to import just from the link. And that's good. Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay. So now let's start writing our actual contract, right? So the way Solidity contracts are written is everything goes inside a contract block. So a contract block is something that looks like contract X, which is like X is the name of the contract and then you have some code inside it. Um, so let's do that. So I'm gonna call mine LW3 token, um, so like, or like learn web three token. Uh, let's just do learn web three token and do this. And like, if you're familiar with like object oriented programming, you've ever done like classes in whatever language, um, you know, like we have a constructor. So a constructor is a function, it's a special function that gets called the first time the contract is deployed to the network, right? You can't call it manually, you cannot call it after it's been deployed, it's just called as part of the deployment, okay? So let's think about what we wanna do. We want to somehow piggyback of this ERC-20 implementation and we want to use it. And ideally we want to get some of our tokens, right? Um, so the way to do that in Solidity, again, if you've worked with classes or object-oriented programming, um, you can inherit classes, right? Like if you work with like Java, JavaScript, uh, C, C++, whatever, um, you can, or like even Python, you can inherit from classes and extend classes, right? So think of ERC-20 as the base contract and your Learn Web 3 token is like borrowing everything it has and like adding some extra like spice on top, right? So the way to like take everything that ERC-20 has is you do, you add like this bit of code here, that's all. So what you're saying is I have a contract, Learn Web 3 token, which is an ERC-20, right? So you're saying like, I want everything that ERC-20 has, and maybe I'll add some more stuff on top of it. So LW3 token here itself is an ERC-20, right? Does that make sense? Um, okay. So another thing we wanna do is, if you notice, in the, uh, I closed the link. Hmm. If you look at the standard, um, oh God, this is not the link I wanted to open. Yeah. If you look at the standard, right? Or actually don't even look at the standard, just look at this. Every token you have has a name, right? It's, it's, it's gotta have a name, right? Like. I have some LW3 tokens here I deployed in the past. We have some ETH, um, or you could have like some Bitcoin or whatever, right? Name it whatever you want. Um, so we want to somehow specify the name of our ERC-20 contract. And to actually understand how this works, let's open the ERC-20 contract file that we're actually importing, right? And look at what they want from us. So don't, um, this, this, this is the important part. Let's look at this. The contract we are importing has its own constructor, right? 
it has its own function that needs to be called when it's deployed. But, and it needs two things from us. It needs its name and it needs a symbol, right? So name, like an example is like the name is like Bitcoin, but the symbol is like BTC, right? Or the name is Ethereum, but the symbol is ETH. Um, so your token wants these two things from you. Um, but the problem is we're not deploying this code, right? We're not deploying this file directly. We're actually deploying our contract. So somehow we need a way to call the constructor of ERC-20 when our contract is deployed. Does that make sense? So normally you have a constructor like this, but now we're saying we also want to call the constructor present inside ERC-20. And the way to do that in Solidity is right after the constructor here, you like write the name of the contract whose constructor you want to call and kind of call it like a function, right? Um, so this is saying this part, this is our constructor, the code block here. Um, and this code is saying run the constructor in ERC20, right? And this will run like this code as I just showed you, but it needs two things from us. It needs the name and it needs a symbol, right? So let's pass it that, let's say, learn web three token is the name. And let's say the symbol for it is learn. You can name these whatever you want, right? It doesn't matter. Um, another cool thing is maybe you don't want to hard code this. Maybe you want to leave it up to whoever is deploying the contract to provide these like name and symbol values as um, function parameters when they're deploying the contract, right? Maybe you don't want to hard code it. So what we can actually do there is let's have our constructor take two arguments and then we just pass it forward. So let's say we also accept a name in our constructor and we also accept a symbol in our constructor, right? And when we do this, instead of hard coding these values, we can just replace them with the variables that we are provided uh, when we deploy the contract. You'll, you'll see, you'll see how this happens. Um, let's, let's actually, let's actually uh, try to compile this once. So to compile, go over to this tab in Remix. This is the compilation tab. Uh, go to compilation, solidity, um, whatever, whatever, whatever and make sure you're selected this file and click compile ldw3token.sol, right? And it's fine. Uh, oh yeah, this warning. Um, is this a warning? You can ignore it if you want, but Solidity likes it if you can specify a license for your code. So is it open source? Is it not open source? Um, do you need a business license? Blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. Um, Usually, if you're writing open source code, you can just go with like the MIT license. If you're writing closed source code, you don't want other people to copy. You can do unlicensed, um, but this is open source, so we'll just do MIT, right? And the warning will go away if I compile again. Cool. Um, cool. So let's see, like if I go ahead, so go to this tab, this is the deployment tab. Um, and first thing you want to do is change your environment. So by default, it's set to JavaScript VM. Uh, oh, okay. I just saw a question. Hold on. I don't know how to download all the applications I'm using. You don't need to download Remix. The only thing you need to download is uh, MetaMask. And you can get MetaMask by like searching on Google. Um, so you need to download that browser extension for MetaMask, but Remix itself is an online code editor. And I shared the link in chat slightly above, but um, 
you can just search for it on Google. Like search for Remix Ethereum and you shall find it. Does that make sense? Um, okay, cool. So yeah, where were we? Okay, so let's go to the deployment tab on Remix. And here, first thing you wanna do is so you wanna change this environment is currently we're using the JavaScript VM, which is not a real Ethereum network, it's just a simulator. Um, so we wanna change that to injected Web3. And what this will use is, it will use the network your MetaMask account is on. So it'll ask you to connect your wallet to Remix. Um, hit yes, hit connect. And then you'll see that it says I'm on the Rinkaby network and like, this, this address here is the same as this address here. And it says I have like 0 0.158 ETH, right? Um, don't forget to do that, it's very important. Um, and now, if you see here, you select like LW3 token as the contract you want to deploy. And right next to deploy, you'll see it wants two things from us. So these are the constructor arguments we said we wanted, right? So instead of hard coding values directly in the contract, I can now give the values as part of deployment and I can do whatever I want here, right? Um, cool. So let's quickly actually try to deploy this and I'll just say uh, the name of this contract is learn web three test token and the symbol is like learn dash test right? And once you've entered those values, um, hit transact. And this will pop open MetaMask saying, okay, you're deploying a contract, it's going to cost you some transaction fees. Um, do you want to confirm or reject this transaction, right? So I'm going to confirm this. And we're going to wait for the contract to be deployed. And you can check the status of it from like MetaMask. So Okay, just got confirmed. Um, so once it is deployed, it should show up here. If you scroll down a little bit here, there will be a deployed contract and it will have all of these functions. So these are all coming from the ERC-20, right? Um, and like if you click on like name, it will say like it has the name that you entered and the symbol is what you entered and currently total supply is like zero. None of these tokens actually exist anywhere, but there's a problem. The problem is how do I get any of these tokens, right? Like sure the contract exists and the contract is deployed, but I don't have any tokens. There's a supply of zero. This is a pretty useless cryptocurrency, right? If you can't even like own it, right? So what we want to do is actually, let me take a sec to look at um, chat. Is there something going on? Um, okay. Okay. Seems, seems fine. Um, cool. So um, yeah. So we want to somehow get some tokens for ourselves. Get, why is this flickering? Do you see the flicker on the live stream? Get some tokens for ourselves. That is weird. I don't know why that's happening. Um, cool. So how do we get some token for ourselves? This, let's, let's like, let's take a look at the ERC20 contract we're importing. Um, so this contract has a function inside it called mint, right? And you don't see mint over here in your previous deployed contract, like it's not a function you can call because it is an internal function. What does that mean? I won't get into the details of it right now because that's kind of part of um, Sophomore, but essentially it means that internal functions cannot be called by users. It can only be called from inside the smart contract, okay? Um, and what this mint function does is 
creates the amount number of tokens, which is a parameter to this function, and assigns them to the given account, right? And thereby increases the total supply of the token. So I want to mint some tokens to myself when I deploy the contract, right? So let's see. So I, I can just call the function um, mint and it needs an address and it needs an amount, right? So for address, we can do message.sender. So this is the person deploying the contract. This is a global variable injected by um, Ethereum when you deploy the contract. So this is the person who makes this transaction. So in this case, it would be like me, right? And so like message.sender is the person deploying the contract. And the amount is, let's say I want like a thousand tokens, okay? And hmm, I wonder if I should explain this. Okay, let's say I want a thousand tokens actually, yeah. Um, okay, so the way to get a thousand tokens is you have to do something like this. This is interesting. Uh, this is Solidity syntax, the double asterisk. It's Solidity syntax for exponentiation. So it's like 10 to the power of 18. It's like a really long number. Um, and to get a thousand tokens, we need to get thousand multiplied by 10 to the power of 18. Why is that? This is important. So let's see. The first thing you need to understand here is Solidity does not support floating point numbers, right? So you cannot have numbers like 1.23 or like 0 0.314. These are not allowed. You can only have integers like whole numbers, uh, like positive or negative, but you cannot have floating point numbers in Solidity, right? The other thing you want to understand is when you're dealing with money, like this is a cryptocurrency you're making, right? This is money. Um, when you're dealing with money, it is a very bad idea to use floating point numbers. And what do I mean by that, right? Tell me in chat, what do you think the answer for this should be? If I do one divided by three, whole multiplied by three, right? If I were to do this in like a regular programming language, not Solidity, like be like Java, JavaScript, whatever, what is this equal to? Tell me in chat. Um, I'll wait. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, e, oh. Think about it. it. Seems pretty easy. One by three multiplied by three. What do you think? Hmm. Okay, so we have two answers, right? Zero point nine 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 and one. Why, why, why the disparity? Why, why are some people saying one and some people saying 0 0.999? Which one of these is correct? Is it one or is it 0 0.9999? Those who said this, those who said it's gonna be 0 0.999, um, it's correct, right? Also, Node.js and Python, Anish, to your comment, it will be one if you do this in like a single operation. But if you have them as two separate variables, if you were to do like 
fraction equals like one by three. And then this equals like fraction into three. This will not be one, at least as far as I under recall, I might, be, I might be wrong, but that's, that's besides the point, right? It's actually not going to be one, which is weird. Simple mathematics tells us it should be one, right? Like the threes cancel out. Um, but computers cannot work with infinite precision. One by three is not a rational number. It goes on forever. There's an infinite number of decimal places in it, but your computer doesn't have an infinite amount of memory to work with. So it can only represent one by three to a certain number of decimal units. So maybe like five decimals or like 20 decimals or whatever. And when you multiply that by three, it doesn't quite add up to one. It gets stuck at 0 0.999999, whatever, because our computer doesn't have infinite memory, right? So now, why is this bad when dealing with money? This is bad when dealing with money because if, if you were, so let's say you were building a system where you were handling payments in US dollars, right? And somebody sends you, somebody sends you like, um, like, like fraction of cents. Maybe you're charging like one point two nine dollars for something, and then there's like one point three nine dollars for something, and whatever, whatever, whatever. You're dealing with fractions, right? And let's say you're storing them as fractions. Eventually, when you do calculations on it when you do addition multiplication division subtraction you're gonna run into this problem you're gonna run into the problem that sometimes these mathematical operations won't give you the value you expect them to give you and that is because computers cannot represent infinite decimal numbers right the solution to this and this has been happening for like hundreds of years right like ever since banks, like banks found out this was a problem 50 years ago, right? So in actuality, if you're a bank or if you're a payments provider trying to charge people in dollars, you would not save this as 1.29 in your database. You would actually save this as 129. And what that would represent is the value in cents, which is the smallest unit of the US dollar. You cannot go any smaller than that, like f like cash wise, right? Um, so you get rid of the decimal point entirely and you store those numbers as integers. And when you store those numbers as integers, it will like, then you don't have to deal with this problem, right? Because um, if I were to store one by three as like, 33 cents instead of zero point instead of 0 0.33 dollars um then i know like 33 cents multiplied by three should be 99 cents i'm charging them 33 cents i shouldn't should be charging them one third of a dollar uh which is weird cool and that's like working with integers gets rid of floating point operation problems um this is a whole like topic in computer science, but how to improve floating point multiplication and mathematics generally. What I'm getting to with all of this is why is this part important? Since we don't want to work with, um, actually, let's, let's take a look at this. How much ETH do I have? I have 0 0.155 ETH. Do you think this is stored as 0 0.155 ETH? No, it's not, right? Um, Ethereum units, Ethereum has a lot of like denominations, just like how cents are the smallest value, smallest denomination in a dollar, Ethereum's smallest denomination is what's called a way, right? One way. And one ETH is actually equal to 10 to the power 18 way. That's a lot, right? 
Um, so you can own like a really, 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 really tiny amount of ETH, like one over 10 to the power 18 amount of ETH. And that's a really small number, but that's the smallest value of ETH you can ever own, right? You can ever trade. Um, and like the ETH we're used to talking about is actually a much larger value compared to the smallest denomination. So when it says, when MetaMask tells me I have 0 0.155 ETH, what it actually means is, uh, there's a simple website to convert between ETH units, but if I enter 0 0.155 ETH, what it actually means is I have this much way. That's a big number. Cool. Um, again, why is this relevant? <laughs> All right. Similar to Ethereum, which has which has the smallest unit, which is one way, the tiny, tiny number in ETH. Um, if you count these, there's like 18 decimal places here, which makes sense because like one ETH is 10 to the power 18. Um, similarly, ERC20 tokens, this implementation by Open Zeppelin has a default value of 18 decimals. You can change this if you want, um, but it has a default value of 18 decimals, right? All of this I've been talking about for the last 10 minutes or so is a roundabout way of telling you that when you say you want to mint one token, it doesn't mean you get like, it doesn't mean it will show up as one on MetaMask. What it means, you're getting like one unit of the smallest denomination of that token. So you will actually end up with a number that looks like this in your MetaMask. And this is not really useful, right? You can't really do anything. This is a really, really insignificant amount of cryptocurrency to hold. Um, if you want, if you actually want one token to like show up in your MetaMask, you actually need to mint these many tokens. And this is equal to 10 to the power 18. So if I want one token, I have to mint, I have to say that I want to mint 10 to the power of 18. And then similarly, if I want to mint a thousand tokens, I just take this number and I multiply it by a thousand. Um, that was a really long explanation. Um, yes, we are going to have a video. Um, it will be on YouTube. I will upload it shortly after the live stream is over. Okay, this is a really long explanation. All to write this one tiny line of code, right? <laughs> um, cool. Let's recap. We have this code. It's an ERC20 token. He said the name and symbol. And as part of deployment, it will mint a thousand tokens to my address, right? So let's let's go ahead. I'm gonna delete this old contract so I don't get confused. Um, let's compile this new one again. Let's go. And Let's go to the deployment tab. Let's say the name of the token is learn web three token symbol learn. I click transact. We'll pop open MetaMask and I confirm the transaction and wait for it to go through. Cool, perfect. So now it shows up here and let's see what happened, right? So, well, obviously name and symbol is what we set it. Let's take a look at the total supply. Last time it was zero. This time it is not zero. It's a, it's a big number. Um, if I wanna look at my balance, uh, there's a function called balance of. This is, by the way, the same function that MetaMask is using to show you balances of your tokens. It's just calling this function. Um, 
So if I copy my address and paste it here, I call this, we'll show I, I have a non-zero balance. But I don't see the learn token in my MetaMask. Why is that? Well, the short answer is there's tens of thousands of tokens being created every single day like by people like you and me, right? Like we're learning, we're starting with the basics and we're deploying like so many random tokens every single day. Um, MetaMask cannot magically find out about them, right? Um, for some like really famous tokens, like top of the line, which are like heavily used and have like billions of dollars in volume, those MetaMask automatically detects because it has like special code to detect that. But random tokens that get created by people like you and me, um, MetaMask doesn't magically hear about them in any way. So to have them show up in MetaMask, what you want to do, scroll up here. There's this tiny like copy button here. Um, you copy this. This is your contract address. So when your contract was deployed, it got an address on Ethereum. Uh, you copy that contract address you go to MetaMask and you scroll down and you'll see this tiny like, don't see your token, import token. So you go to import token, input the contract address, and notice how it was able to figure out the symbol and the number of decimals automatically. And the only reason it can do that, again, it goes back to the beginning of this live stream. The only reason it was able to do that is because we're following the ERC20 standard and MetaMask knows what functions I can call to figure out what these values are. I didn't have to manually set them, right? So I input the contract address, add custom token, hit import, and there you go. I have a thousand learn tokens. Um, I can send it to whoever I want. If anybody wants to paste their address on chat, I'll send you some learn tokens. It's 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 totally worthless, right? It's it's on a test network. It's totally worthless, but um, just to show you, if anybody wants any learn tokens, I'll send it to you. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of about it. Um, that's pretty much the entirety of the freshman track cryptocurrency tutorial. At the end of the day, we ended up with like if I get rid of all the comments and stuff, maybe. Um, we'll end up with like 10 lines of code, uh, 10 lines of code to deploy a really simple cryptocurrency. And you can send this to all of your friends. Um, and yeah, like as always, the goal of Learn Web 3 is not to just show you the code. Because if I was to just give you this code without talking about anything, without telling you like what is what does this mean or like what does this thing mean or why we're multiplying by 10 to the power of 18 it doesn't help you right um we would rather take our time and explain you all the concepts behind it um so you can figure out like you understand why things are happening it's not just about what do i do it's also about like why are things happening right um all right What's all? I'll send you some tokens. All right. So say I'll send you like fifty learn tokens, right? So this is address fifty learn tokens. There you go. It should. It's on their way. Um, again, MetaMask won't show these automatically in your wallet. So if you want the learn token to show up in your wallet. I'll drop a link in chat for you. Um, oh, where is my YouTube live stream go? Did I? Oh, there we go, live streaming. Um, there you go. Yeah, uh, anybody who's getting my token, like the learn token, add this address to your MetaMask to see it. Um, Cool. We have we have some questions. Let's let's try to answer those. So, is it possible to increase the token supply after deploying to the network? Absolutely. Um, this is a really simple example where we only mint 
as part of the constructor call, right? Like we don't mint uh, anywhere else, which sort of like limits the total supply. Um, there can never be more than a thousand tokens of this contract uh, of this like cryptocurrency. You can get around it pretty easily. And we cover this in the sophomore track when we build the ICO, uh, where the ICO allows people to buy, um, like, it allows them to buy tokens from you in exchange for ETH, right? They give you like one ETH in exchange for a thousand tokens, right? And based on how many people buy, the more tokens get introduced in the market, right? Or if you just want anybody to be able to mint however many tokens they want and there's an unlimited supply of tokens, you can actually do that pretty easily with like, let's say we make a function called mint um, and let's make this public so anybody can call it. And all it does, it, it does the exact same thing as here, right? It does the exact same thing. And what will happen is if I compile this and then I deploy this, this version of the contract, um, let's see, learn web three token mint mint learn mint right if i deploy this version of the contract so note that this is a public function right anybody can call it um wait for the contract to be deployed cool here we are so now see like since this is a public function let's take a look at what my balance is right in the beginning, I should have gotten a thousand tokens from the constructor call. So if I look at my balance, it's like this large number, right? But now I can go and click mint, which will again open up MetaMask and say that you're doing a transaction. I click confirm, wait for the transaction to get confirmed. All right, so cool. Now the transaction is confirmed. If I check my balance again now, you see the one change to a two here. And I can do this as much as I want. There's there's no maximum supply. I can keep calling this function and every single time I call it, I will get a thousand new tokens. And yeah, um, so it's it's not just limited to like minting in the constructor. You can mint wherever you want. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, Cool. Let's see. Um, memory keyword. Let's, uh, Yesh and Anish, um, let's get to the memory keyword in a little bit if there's no other questions about cryptocurrency tutorial directly. Um, actually, no, we, we do use memory here. Hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll try to give a short explanation. Um, so yeah, what, what does this memory mean? Um, essentially, I don't want to go too much in depth because it can be a little confusing, but essentially, think about your computer, right? You have a hard disk, you have a RAM, and then your processor has some cache, right? So like when your processor is working really, really fast, it stores temporary values in its cache to like allow it to quickly read and write from those values, right? The, the, the time it takes to read and write those values is very, very small, like extremely tiny. But if it has to read and write values from the RAM, it takes a little more time because then there's like a communication flow, like processor reaches out to the RAM. It tells it, hey, I want this value. RAM replies back to the processor with, hey, here's your value. And if you go to the hard disk, it takes even longer because like hard disks are slower than RAM, right? Um, similarly, uh, but, the, but the important thing is not speed here. The important thing is you use different types of storage on your computer based on like what kind of work you're doing with it, right? 
So the processor cache is really small. It can't hold a lot of information, but it stores like temporary stuff there uh, when it's working fast to like um, do some calculations, for example. Your RAM is sort of like where like most of high level things are stored. So like I have my browser open here. All of these tabs, the data inside these tabs is stored on my RAM, right? That's why like the more RAM you have, the faster typically your computer is because like it can store more data. Um, but when your RAM is full, then your computer resorts to storing things in the hard drive. And that's like, that's memory intensive to read and write from the hard drive. So if you have a computer with small amount of RAM, and you open a lot of tabs in Chrome, um, it becomes slow because then the RAM is out of space. It has to read and write data to the hard disk and then it becomes laggy and your computer starts slowing down. Um, so the point is different types of storage for different types of things, right? In Solidity, you have some variables that are numbers. So things like UIN256 um, or like int256, then you have some variables which are like uh, like booleans or you have like bytes. And then you have string. And then you have arrays. Can anybody tell me what's the main difference between these two categories? What is the main difference between any of these types of data compared to these types of data? I'll wait for a couple of minutes. Yeah, so they are they are stored in a distinct place, but why? Okay, Dhananjay, you hit it right on the spot. Fixed versus variable lengths, right? Numbers, booleans, and bytes, they have a fixed length. When you say you went 256, you know that this, this is a 256-bit number. It cannot take any less space it cannot take any more space than 256 bits. All of these variable types are fixed in size. They only take a certain amount of space regardless of what their value is. Strings and arrays, on the other hand, are not fixed types, right? Like a string that looks like hello has a much different size than a string that looks like hello my name is Hardik, right? This is a much longer string that requires much more space to fit itself than hello, right? So, and like, it would help if you think about it with the fact that strings in Solidity are actually just character arrays, right? Um, so yeah, like Solidity has like a fixed data type character and strings in Solidity are just arrays of characters, right? So in general, the concept of memory applies to arrays and strings are arrays, right? So since these use, these are not fixed values and the length is variable, you don't know how much, when, when I provide these values as part of like function arguments in the constructor, the contract does not know beforehand how much space will be needed to store these strings, right? It cannot predict it because I might just enter hello or I might enter hello, my name is Hardik, right? The contract can't predict that, it's up to me. Um, because of that, what it means is the contract cannot store strings or like arrays in general on the cache the CPU cache kind of what I was talking about. Um, 
So the Ethereum virtual machine has something very similar to a CPU cache, but um, over there, it can only store fixed size values because it can predict, it knows. Like if I'm, if my constructor argument is a UN256, it, no matter what value I give to it, it knows that, okay, I need 256 bits for this number. It doesn't matter what number it is. But when I'm giving it a string, it doesn't know. It just doesn't know. So it cannot store these in cache. There's no way it can store these in cache because maybe it exceeds the size of the entire cache. Because of this, arrays need to be marked as memory variables. Memory is the analogy for RAM in your computer. And what you're telling Solidity to do is store these things in RAM instead of storing it in the cache. And actually, if you remove the memory keyword from here and you try to compile this code, it will not compile. It will tell you an error. It will give you an error because it's like, I, I cannot store strings. I cannot store arrays in cache. You need to store them in memory. Um, yeah, we, we covered this topic in a little more depth in Sophomore, advanced solidity topics. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that explanation makes sense. All right, also we're gonna aim to um, end this stream at 11.15 EST. We've been here for over an hour, so just to respect everyone's time, if there's, maybe we'll take like a couple more questions if you have them. Otherwise, like, um, feel free to ask them on Discord as you go. Um, so yeah, we'll have like, what, like five, six more minutes if there's a few more questions. And then I will end the stream and I will shortly upload the recording to YouTube and share it on the Discord. Awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, shoot. Um, no, so you cannot change the contract. Contracts on Ethereum are immutable. So like, there's no way to change the code of a contract after it is deployed. Um, but like when you're joining an ICO, ICOs typically have a maximum supply, right? We have an ICO tutorial in the sophomore track where you have a maximum supply of like 10,000 tokens. And for every one ETH, you can buy a hundred tokens and once all 10,000 tokens sell out, um, the ICO is over, like the sale is over. And then those 10,000 tokens just exist and move around and you can trade them and whatever. Discord access, um, yes, you can find it on the website. So if you go to learnweb3.io, uh, you can join the Discord by clicking this button here. Um, yeah. And when you join the Discord, like, the only thing you gotta do is join the Discord. You'll be entered into the verification channel originally. I don't know if you can see this. But yeah, you'll be entered into the verification channel. And in the verification channel, just hit the fire button. Um, and there's like a guide on like how to get started learning with us. So hit the fire button and that will give you access to the rest of the channel where you can ask your questions and build with other people and do pair programming and stuff like that.
when we use mapping from address to uint array and hit on the remix button, it will not return the array. That is true. And the reason for this, again, is it's the fact that Solidity doesn't know how big the arrays are, right? Um, since Solidity, since arrays can be arbitrarily large, you can have no elements in an array, you can have 10 elements in an array, or you can have like a million elements in an array, right? It is unreasonable that Solidity will return you a million elements when you're returning an array from a function. Um, so if you want to access items in an array in Solidity, you have to give it an index. You, have, you can only access items at certain indexes if you give the index, right? So the common way to do something like that is like, let's say, well, let's say I have a uint array numbers. Um, usually what you want to do is you also want to store another uint saying length of numbers. And then every time you add a new value here, every time you do like numbers.push, um, you also like increment this. So every time you do like numbers.push, uh, some value x, you also want to do length of numbers plus plus. And then when you want to read these values, you first read the length. So let's say like length is five. And then in your code, you want to run a loop. So like for i equals zero to five. Um, and then here you can access like the individual values. That's how you loop over, that's how you read values of an entire array. And then here is you can like, here you can like, this is pseudocode, this is not real code. This, will, this exact thing will not work. But yeah, here you read the values individually. That's the way to do it. You cannot expect Solidity to return you variable length arrays as part of the function. All right, um, cool. It's 11.15, guys. I am going to rug this live stream. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. This was really fun. Um, I think we're going to do more of this. I will publish the recording on YouTube shortly. Um, yeah, Anish, let's, let's take this to the Discord, but the reason for that error is the same. You cannot return arrays um, from a function. It will not work. Um, you have to return them at specific indices, like specific values given an index. But okay, I'm going to rug this live stream. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, we're going to do more of these. We'll have announcements to say like which topics we're going to cover. Um, I might not be as active in the coming week on Discord because I'm going to be traveling the rest of next week, but I'll check Discord occasionally. Um, but yeah. Could I explain how to use MetaMask? Um, well, let's, let's, let's take this in the Discord. Um, you can find the Discord invite link on the website. I really have to cut off the live stream at the moment. I have to hop off to another meeting. I'm sorry about that. But yeah, let's 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 take it to the Discord, a message on the Discord, and I'll help you set up your MetaMask there. Awesome. Cool guys. I'll see you around. Have a good day.